Well, hey there, viewers. You requested, and I am happy to oblige. We got ourselves a lovely European car to work on. It's a 2002 BMW 330CI? I think it's a 330CI. It has a uh, 3.0 liter six cylinder engine, and uh, it's got a check engine light complaint. That's pretty much all I know. So we're gonna go straight to the scan tool, have a little look at trouble codes, and see how we wanna attack this fine, um, is fine even a good word for these things? I don't know, in my opinion, fine's definitely not a good word for these, but let's go ahead and identify this thing. BMW is an O2. Let's try the auto ID. This might take forever, so yeah, be right back. And there we go. So let's see what we have. I'm gonna go straight for the uh, straight for the engine menu. Go up in here, yada yada, random European vehicle, random European vehicle text that we're seeing there. Man, these things are slow. It is definitely tough trying to trying to work around communicating with these Euro cars, at least using the Varus. I really need to get myself an Autel. I've been, you know, I've mentioned that in a couple other videos. But I really think that it would be a huge help dealing with these cars. Okay, so it looks like we have a NOCOM. That's a little weird. Let me see. Let's try to do this old school. Let's go... See, and that's another thing with the Varus, man. I run into this all the time. Let's see if we can go global. Maybe we'll get lucky with the... Uh, maybe we'll get lucky through the global menu. Um, I'm on Varus 15.4. That's probably worth mentioning. I'm not sure if uh, the newer Varuses had this issue or not. So uh, let me see what goes on with this communication here, and we'll pan back. So it seems like we're uh, seems like we might be good for global. So I'm going to go to mode three. That's going to give us our trouble codes just to see what we have. It looks like the OE portion of the scan tool is not going to be of help to us on this. So it looks like we have two transmission fault codes, and that was a little weird how they popped up like that. Okay. Uh, so we have a PO313, low fuel misfire. We also have a P0174, two lean bank two, P0171, two lean bank one. And it looks like we also have some uh, transmission codes. So um, for the sake of simplicity here, I think I want to start out by focusing on these fuel trim codes. So uh, I think that's what we're gonna do. Um, I'm probably going to address these transmission faults in a different video. But uh, yeah, let's just stay focused on this P0174 and P0171. So the first thing I like to do when I'm talking about lean fault codes is uh, I try not to run the vehicle for too long. And the reason for that is oftentimes, uh, you know, any sort of vacuum leak or anything like that, it's gonna be sensitive to temperature. So luckily this vehicle is cold. It's not at operating temperature. It hasn't been ran very long, just long enough to get it into the shop. So uh, the first thing we can do is take a look at freeze frame, see what sort of load conditions we were under when this fault code set. And then we can start the vehicle up and we can take a look at fuel trims and you know, see how those look. This being a lean fault, we should have elevated fuel trims. But uh, as far as first steps, let's take a look at freeze frame data so we know what conditions to put the vehicle in to hopefully duplicate this complaint. The thing about using global freeze frame data is sometimes the freeze frame data isn't going to be for the fault code that you want. Um, going, through, going through some OE menus, especially on GM, you can actually look at freeze frame data for each individual fault code that was set in the engine computer. Um, I don't believe that we're gonna have that sort of functionality through the OE menu on a BMW, but then again, we can't even get onto the OE side of things because we're having communication issues between the uh, Snap-on Varus and this, and this BMW here. So it looks like we did get lucky as far as this P0171 goes. Um, as far as coolant temperature goes, that's one thing I'm definitely looking at. 201 degrees Fahrenheit, so no real risk of running this vehicle. Um, looking at engine speed, looks like it were right about 2,000 RPM. So it appears as this is an off idle lean condition, um, at least potentially a low load lean condition, low RPM, something like that. Uh, vehicle speed, 39 miles an hour, that's definitely some good info. So it looks like uh, at the time that this fault code set, 
may have just been cruising around in the city, something like that, you know, real light throttle, sort of rolling down the road. And uh, the real thing that we need to pay attention to here are short term and long term. Uh, for bank one and bank two, we're floating around seven, uh, seven positive seven on the short term, and then uh, right around 10, 11 for the long terms of both banks. So let's actually start the vehicle up, take a look at some live data, and uh, see how those look. Now that I have these fuel trims pulled up on the screen, I'm going to go ahead and start the vehicle up. And I had to move the key backwards, so there's a good chance we lost communication. Well, it looks like we may have got lucky. Uh, take a note of this counter down here. That's counting our frames that we're measuring, and it is god awful slow. That's pretty typical when dealing with these European cars. So uh, we need to let this thing get into closed loop, and then we'll start taking an eye at some of these trim corrections. So I'm getting a little bit of response as far as short-term trims go now. Um, I'm not seeing any current long-term correction going on. I'm not too certain about what's going on there. I'm just gonna jump in the car and I'm gonna raise the engine RPM up a little bit just to get these oxygen sensors working faster. And hopefully we'll get some sort of correction going for this long-term. Just holding this around 3,000 RPM, uh, we're not quite at operating temperature. Or maybe, uh, maybe a quarter of the way there. Now I'm not looking at the scan tool you guys are. I'm trying to give you the best shot I can. All right, that should be pretty good. We'll take another look, see how, see how this data looks now. So like while we were on the gas, our fuel trims were definitely elevated. I st still don't have anything on this long term. I'm really, I'm really not certain why that is. Um, I try not to put too much stake in this, especially when you're talking about a European car over a global menu. And you know, I don't know, there's, there's guys out there that work on these a lot that could probably give you an answer to what's going on here a lot better than I can. But uh, at least initially, I'm not really seeing an issue with these trims. I mean, short terms are pretty clear, pretty close to zero. I still don't like how these long terms are stuck at zero. So let me see, I'm gonna back out of this. I'm gonna go back into this menu, maybe stopping communication and reinitiating it. We'll sort of refresh this. Cause really, I mean, there should be some sort of long-term correction there. I mean, we, we had trouble codes. So we know that the memory wasn't wiped out. You know, even if the memory were wiped out and those long terms were in fact fixed at zero, you know, our short terms are still fairly close to that. I mean, it's running a little bit lean. You know, we do have that, we do have that addition of about five, six percent on both banks, but you know, not, not anywhere near the level that we saw in our freeze frame data. So I'm just gonna dis deselect this, pull these long terms back up. We also look at O2s. And look at this, we're pretty limited here. We only have voltage values for bank one as far as our O2s go. So that's, uh, that's a little bit concerning. Man, when you're dealing with these Euro cars, you are super limited in what you can do if you don't have the right, the right hardware. And I mean, I just, I just don't, this is all I have. So taking a look at this again, short terms appear pretty normal. Yep, definitely. Definitely nothing too, nothing too bad. I'm gonna jump back in the car and I'm actually gonna power brake this a little bit. So I just threw it in drive. We had a pretty big RPM kick down. I'm giving it some throttle now, just sort of power braking it, using the transmission to load the engine. We'll take a look at these fuel trims as I do this. So it looks like we're getting some long-term correction here now. We'll zoom back out on this.
I mean, it's possible that our O2s aren't working, aren't working all that great yet. You know, even though we did try and heat them up. Let's look at our max numbers, 13 and 12. I mean, it's still not that high. You know, where that event was, was right around in here. I don't know, you know, honestly, I'm not seeing it. Um, let's go into the hood and do a visual inspection. When I have a vehicle like this, um, especially a European vehicle where I'm very limited on what I can do, scan data wise, scan tool wise, um, I never discount a visual inspection. Oftentimes a visual inspection can tell you things that scan data can't. Um, this is looking like an intermittent condition for sure. So really a visual inspection might get us going in the right direction because really right now I don't really have any. Um, the vehicle's almost at operating temperature. Um, it does need to warm up a little bit more to truly get it in the conditions that it was in when this fault code set. Um, you know, we might also need to go test drive the vehicle too to see if we can duplicate this lean condition. But, you know, first up, let's just do a visual. Let's see what we see under the hood. So while I'm doing this visual inspection, I'm just going to leave you there. Um, you know, I'll bring you in on it if I see something. But I'm going to check the common areas, you know, really anything in front of the mass airflow sensor. You need to be concerned with things, you know, behind the mass airflow sensor a little bit, you know, if we had an air filter issue. But I don't know, I'm just trying to keep this easy, keep it simple. So I'm taking a real good look at this intake air boot. Just sort of flexing it around, making sure the hoses are tight, I'm looking around for cracks, giving it a pull. It looks like it's firmly planted on there. When you're talking about stuff like this too, uh, history is everything. You know, if any repair work has been done on the vehicle recently, that may give you a heads up into, uh, you know, if something was potentially left loose or anything like that. Um, I'm not sure what the history is on this car. I can definitely figure that out. But as far as anything around this, around this intake air boot, I'm not, I'm not seeing anything at all. I'm checking out this diesel unit. You can't see it, but uh, it's a common issue on these BMWs. They definitely like to leak. So I'm seeing something a little concerning. It looks like a vacuum line for, uh, looks like uh, it goes to the bottom of the purge solenoid. It's got a clip that's not all the way in. And, you know, potentially depending on, depending on purge status, if, you know, if we are purging, you know that you know that could potentially cause a lean condition so i'm, I'm going to keep that in mind i'm just going to continue working on around taking a look at this pcv tube and a lot of this stuff is real tough to see i mean they really just cram this thing oh that's not bolted down sweet they, <laughs> they really just cram this uh cram this thing in here so let me see it's like another piece of the pcv system right here Check our oil cap, that's another one, it, it appears tight. Um, oil leaks are not to be discounted either. Um, oil leaks can absolutely cause lean trouble codes. I see that the valve cover over here is leaking a little bit. So I'm definitely keeping that in mind too. Yeah, it looks like this valve cover is leaking all the way around. So yeah, I mean, as far as anything obvious, I mean, that's all I'm seeing. So I'm going to let this thing run for a little bit more, take another look at these fuel trims and uh, see how they look after that. So I've given it a little bit now. I've uh, been messing around with this car in the bay for a while, just hoping to get it to act up and I just, I can't. So we're going to need to go take it for a test drive. Got a clear shot out of the wormhole. So I'm going to do my best to, uh, keep you focused on this data and drive safely at the same time and see the data myself. I mean, I can always play this back. So not too big of a deal. Yeah, I mean, with some of these drivability problems like this, you know, like this lean condition, I mean, you just, you just have to drive it. You know, and that that's really what kind of stinks about about intermittent issues. So we're just driving along. I'm gonna find a nice flat piece of road so we can analyze some data. So the screen's gonna be pretty glared up, but uh, 
I've got some short-term data. I've also got mass airflow grams per second pulled up. I'm just going to get this thing back out here. I'm just going to do a sort of hard acceleration. And this thing does have a transmission problem. I think it's stuck in third gear right now. That would be those transmission fault codes we were dealing with. Couldn't really rub it out there. I mean, the traffic is absolutely ridiculous. You know, this is probably 545, 6 o'clock, rush hour. Bring this back to a stop. You know, what really stinks about this too is we're doing this with limited data because I can't go to the OE menu. So this is wide open throttle. That would be that transmission issue. It feels like it's stuck in third. But I'm repping it out anyways just to see how it looks. You know, eventually we'll get going. I really care about peak mass airflow here. All right, let's take a look at what we got during that. So taking a quick look at uh, our peak airflow rate, and I know it's tough to see because of the glare. Uh, looks like we only got up to about 80 grams per second. That's definitely uh, definitely not what I was hoping for. Uh, but then again, couldn't really rub this thing out too well given the transmission problems. I'm going to give it another try now. Just got done driving this BMW. I drove it, for around, drove it around a little bit more off camera just because it was easier and it was safer. Um, I was still having difficulty getting this lean condition to happen. Um, I definitely seen that every once in a while under very certain load conditions, very, very partial load, um, my short terms were somewhat elevated around 10 to 15 positive. Uh, not a whole lot of reaction from the long terms during that. Um, again, could be an issue with the scan tool talking to this thing. So I'm not really putting too much of a, uh, putting too much faith in that. But from the little that I did see during the test drive, it appears that this is a lean under load sort of situation we're dealing with. And uh, when I did do that one good hard pull, you know, I wasn't able to get it all the way wound out, but I definitely didn't like our peak grams per second as far as the mass airflow sensor goes. So almost what I wanna do at this point, just cause I'm really struggling for direction is I just wanna pull this mass airflow sensor out and just take a look at it and uh, see if it's contaminated or anything like that. Maybe do some tap tests, not sure. So here's our mass airflow, um, suspect number one. Um, as far as getting a view of it, it's got these little metal clips that you can't see, but it looks like I should be able to just snap this thing off of the air box and maybe pull it out and have a look. Oh yeah, perfect. So I'm just seeing if I can get a view of the, uh, get a view of the hot wire. It's pretty tough. It's got this little honeycomb on the front of it. You know, I'm not even sure if this is a hot film mass airflow. But you know, honestly, it looks clean. Looking in there, taking a look at the air filter, it is in place. This O-ring looks to be in place too. It's got a little O-ring that seals it. Let me see. I'm gonna shove this back in. Clip that thing back down. I think next up, let's try some tap tests on this. What I'm hoping to do with this test is I'm hoping to get lucky because I'm getting a little frustrated. Taking a look at these fuel trims, I mean, we are dead on the money. Short term is very close to zero. Long term is pretty much stuck around 1.6. I really feel like there's some sort of scan data, scan data issue going on there. But all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this little flashlight and I'm just gonna gently tap on this mass airflow sensor. I'm going to zoom you in to uh, this grams per second data parameter as well as these short terms. And we're going to keep an eye on that while I do this tap test. And what I'm hoping to accomplish is I'm hoping to uh, I'm hoping to generate some sort of bonkers response in our short terms as well as this airflow rate data pad. So I'm just doing my tappy test now. And I've had success with this, especially on GMs. You know, like an old Buick 3800 series that rolls in, doing some wonky stuff. You can sometimes get it to show its face doing this. But I'm not having any luck. And I'm not beating on this thing hard. You know, I don't want to damage the sensor if it's good. I mean, we're not, we're not changing at all. 
Oh boy. Yeah, absolutely no change. Oh man, this can be frustrating. It can definitely be frustrating. Let me try some more rev ups. I'm just gonna ease on the gas here. You know, we're, we're in park just idling. Just wanna see what these numbers do again. About 1200 RPM here. Short terms still appear to be pretty, pretty normal. We can see our math grams per second is climbing. Just slowly easing on to this. Probably around 1700 RPM now. Short term still appear to be pretty good. About 2,500 here. Not much throttle. See, we went way negative there. Coming back off. All right, I'm gonna give it one more time. You know, it really stinks about this. See, look at that. See, we were pretty lean for a second there. I think it was right around 1500 RPM when that happened. Let me try and do that again. But I mean, this is not bad, you know? I feel like we're reaching. I feel like I'm reaching. So we were floating around 11 for a little bit there. But uh, remember before, you know, our long turns were high too. But this long term fuel trim is stuck at 1.6. It's not even moving. I wanna go back out of this. Go back into data. Man, this is so slow. So long terms are still at 1.6. I just, I don't really understand why that is. If one of you guys understands that, you know, please let me know. You know, and it doesn't change through any RPM load. It's like, it's like it doesn't have any other cells other than that 1.6 one. I mean, I, I feel like it has to be an issue with the scan tool. So, I mean, every once in a while for just a split second, we'll go up to 14, but I mean, how much can you, you know, how much faith can you really put in these short terms under violent conditions like that? Let's take a look at these O2s, just for the hell of it. So bank one, sensor one, bank one, sensor two. And look at the scaling. That's all messed up. We gotta correct our scales here. Sorry for the shakiness of this. These are the only oxygen sensors we can look at. Uh, we can't look at anything on bank two. It's just not populating on the scan tool. I don't 
don't like how the sensor two is behaving. But really, the scan data refresh rate is so slow. <sighs> Hard to really tell anything. Kind of a weird glitch right there, huh? Then again, slow refresh rate. I don't know, man. I don't know. So currently, this is where we're at. Um, we're very, very limited in what we can do with the scan tool, uh, given the fact that we can't look at all the oxygen sensors. Um, this also appears to be an intermittent condition. Um, we sort of start, started off doing a visual inspection on this thing just to see if we saw anything obvious. Um, given what we've got going on here, I think that's probably gonna be what I want to go back to. I wanna look at this thing a little bit harder maybe sort of get, get out of the whole film a video mode and really put my eyes on this thing and uh, see if I can see anything sort of, sort of popping out at me as far as what's going on here. I mean, no doubt this is, inter this is an intermittent condition and I'm just having one heck of a time duplicating it. Um, I'm not really suspicious of the mass airflow. I mean, it could be acting up maybe when it gets hot. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know. So let's go back to the visual inspection. Let's check this BMW out real hard and let's see if we see anything on this thing. So this is going to be less about, less about video quality and more about getting this car figured out. So I'm just gonna redo this visual inspection and I'm, on, I'm gonna go off camera mode. Uh, I'm probably not gonna talk as much. I really need to focus in on this and uh, see if I see anything. See if I see anything abnormal. It does have a new diesel valve on here. Looks like a fine Dorman part. Again, I don't think that's our issue. Eyeballing this intake boot. It's definitely, definitely firmly fastened. It appears to have been replaced recently. The dipstick is seated fully. There is an air filter in the box. The mass airflow does not appear contaminated which I mean, if it were, you know, we would have some crazy positive trims under load. And I mean, that's just not the case here. You know, this thing runs great other than the transmission being stuck in third gear. Oil filter cap is tight. Oil fill cap is tight. What is this? So I didn't notice this my first time around but it's looking, I almost don't want to touch it. It looks, it looks suspect. Let me get you focused in on what I'm looking at. So take a look at this new jobber. This is electrical tape, but it's been on here for so long that it sort of blended into the rest of the hose. I mean, it's got dirt and soot all over it. It goes down to this little nipple. Uh, this nipple plugs into the intake manifold here, or whatever this thing is. I'm not super familiar with the beamers. It's got another hose that goes down there. But uh, zooming in on this thing, it, it looks like electrical tape wrapped around a hose clamp. I mean, that looks like that looks like the nut of a hose clamp to me. So here's what I want to do. Let's get set back up on the tripod. I'm gonna wiggle this thing around while we watch fuel trims and see what happens. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play around with this hose, which is right here. And you guys are gonna focus in on our, uh, on our fuel trims. I realize this angle is not ideal at all, so I apologize for that. Having some trouble getting you, getting you propped up. Oh, oh! Oh my goodness, okay, that's, this isn't working. This is not working. Okay, that's gonna have to work. So it looks like right now, we're floating around seven, positive seven on both our short term for both banks. Our long term is still at 1.6, it's a little tough to see on that side of the screen. I'm just going to push on this hose gently, just sort of wiggle it around, see what happens. So I'm pulling on that hose now, 
and what do you know? Both banks, our short-term fuel trim is climbing. Let's see how high this goes. So way, way up there. I can also hear a hiss when I do that. I've got the hose off now. I'm not, I'm not pressing on it, not touching it anymore. I can hear kind of a weird rattle coming from it now. Our short term's coming back down. I'm gonna let you guys listen to the hiss while I play with this hose. And also give you a shot of me doing it. So, I don't know if you can see the short term, but they're climbing back up. Hopefully you can hear that hiss. I do believe that this, uh, this is our issue. So I say we unwrap this thing, take a look at it. Someone's obviously been here and done some wonky stuff. So let's unwrap this little Christmas present, shall we? Um, I'm not sure how this little thing is clipped on. Oh, wow, look at, the, look at, what in the, wow, man, what in the world? Okay, so that, that little connector on that valve, I'm not sure how that disconnects. It looks like it has a little, looks like it has a little tab, a little quick disconnect tab that hooks onto there. I would need to spray it off with some brake clean to really see it, but okay. So this, <laughs> so this is what we've got going here. We've got some uh, grade A electrical tape, which is saturated with oil. Um, and it looks like what someone did was they took a little piece of this hose. It looks like this is a, it looks like it's just a piece of rubber hose. It is, it's just a piece of rubber hose and it's all swollen. It's all swollen from oil. So they took a piece of rubber hose and they stuck two hose clamps on it. And they, uh, they bridged the gap between these two. This is a hard line, you know, it's not a soft line. They bridge the gap of these two with this thing to uh, try and fix this vacuum leak. So here's my thoughts on this. I think that intermittently this thing was leaking and that's really what's causing our codes. You know, that would, that would, uh, that would match up with our freeze frame data as far as just being around 1800, 1900 RPM. You know, it was definitely, a, definitely lower on the RPM range. That's when a vacuum leak's gonna have more of an effect on an engine's runnability, as it were. So, uh, you know, I think this is our problem. The, you know, one issue with that is, is we didn't really duplicate it sort of in its natural habitat, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay with making this call. So really the fix for this vehicle needs to be to fix this hose. Um, looks like it goes around to the back of the intake back here. And, you know, obviously it snaps in there, probably a dealer only part, um, not 100% on that. But uh, that's what's gonna take care of this. But uh, yeah. So I feel pretty good with ending it with that. Um, this is somewhat of a difficult diagnosis. Um, it could have been made easier if I was a little bit more diligent in my visual inspection starting off on this thing. Um, Cause really when we went through this thing together that first time, that really didn't, really didn't uh, jump out at me as being anything. Um, I guess it's been on here for so long, it sort of blended in with the rest of the uh, nasty, nasty German plastic. Um, that being said, um, oftentimes you'll have situations like this where you couldn't really duplicate the complaint, but you have a pretty strong suspicion that you know what's causing the customer's complaint, you know what's causing the condition. So here's how I sell these jobs, just so you know, and I think it's sort of the best thing to do. I'm gonna tell this customer, hey, I found a vacuum leak at this hose, looks like someone's rigged this up at some point in this vehicle's life. Uh, not sure what's going on there, but uh, you know, I'm fairly confident this is causing your, causing your issue and we need to get it taken care of but advise them that because you weren't able to really see the condition in its sort of natural habitat and uh, you know, make, make some good observations on the car like that, you know, just advise them that there's the potential for another issue. Um, I think that you and I both know as technicians, you know, this is probably what's going on with this thing. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty obvious problem, you know, just being able to press on that hose and get this thing to leak and drive our, drive our fuel trims high. You know, that definitely matches the symptoms. It matches the fault code. It matches the freeze frame data as far as load requirements and load conditions go. 
So I feel good about selling this repair to the customer. Again, communication is key. I mean, it really is. When you're talking about a customer that gets mad and you know they come back angry that something wasn't fixed right on their car or whatever, oftentimes it's communication. It's communication between the advisor and the, and the customer didn't take place and they, they weren't in the know as far as what was going on. So for this, we're gonna to talk to the customer. We're gonna let, let them know exactly what we did. And we're gonna let them know what the fix is. And you know, we're gonna let them know, hey, the potential for other issues is still there, but we're pretty sure you're gonna be straight with this. So anyways, hopefully this gave you some insight into troubleshooting some difficult intermittent conditions and just kind of hanging in there, staying, you know, staying true to the cause. So this is another episode of Triangle Diagnostics. Thanks for watching.